Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Cedar Rock this morning. We're so grateful that you can join us today for worship in our time of Advent as we have been reflecting on the, uh, the love, the hope, and today the joy that comes as we remember how we were expecting Jesus and now as we expect his second coming as well. So today we were excited to, to reflect upon the joy of Christ. So let's begin with a word from Psalm 118, 24. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let's pray. Father God, we come today before you and we come rejoicing. Rejoicing because you came and sent your son the first time. Rejoicing because you're coming back. And so Father, we pray that you would fill our hearts with joy, fill this room with joy. As we worship you today, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. This morning, our prayer first praise hymn is Go into the World, page 87 in the Red Hymn Notes. And we will sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Please stand. Father, we are so grateful that we can have joy and how you brought joy to the world through the coming of Jesus. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Again, welcome to Cedar Rock this morning. We're so grateful that you're here today for worship. A couple of brief announcements. Uh, first up, next Sunday, December 19th is our Christmas cantata. And the choir has been working really hard. They're going to have uh, some more rehearsals to come this Wednesday and upcoming as they uh, lead us in worship next Sunday. Also, as a part of this, some of our kids are going to have a role as well. They're going to, uh, maybe the little ones sing, sing a song and the older ones recite some verses for us. So it's going to be a special time of worship next Sunday, December 19th at 11. We hope you can join us for that time. Also, uh, we're going to have a, a very simple uh, Christmas party in the Fellowship Hall basement after the service next Sunday. So if you want to just hang out for a few minutes after the service next Sunday, uh, after the cantata, we'll have that uh, in, the, in the basement Fellowship Hall as well. Then the following Wednesday, December 22nd, I don't know what you're doing that night, but you have new plans. 6.30 p.m., we're going to have a Christmas candlelight service in here as we recite the Christmas story Sing hymns together by candlelight. It'll be a beautiful time of worshiping the Lord together. Uh, and so I really hope you, you, you can make a point, even if you, especially if you don't typically come on a Wednesday night, this will be a special time of worship uh, as we worship the Lord with, uh, by candlelight as well. One more uh, reminder, the Lottie Moon Christmas offering is ongoing. Uh, we have raised 16, no, we've raised $1,200 so far. 
Uh, four, huh? 12, uh, 1,240. Our goal is 1,600, so prayerfully consider how you can give to help us uh, send missionaries all around the world to spread the good news of Jesus. Uh, a couple of things as we pray this morning we want to lift up. First, uh, we want, we're glad to have David Johnson back with us uh, this Sunday. We'll give you a clap for him. <laughs> Been through a roller coaster uh, a couple of weeks with his own health and things going on. Really, is a, a roller coaster few months in a year, really, with all, the, all that you've been through. So we're continuing to pray for David Johnson. Uh, we're also good to have, have Miss Robin with us today. We're continuing to pray for you, Miss Robin, with your ups and downs as well, uh, with your health. And we're uh, we going to continue to pray uh, for Miss Kat Nelms and Ms. Peggy Pinnell, uh, Glenda Parrish, who's here and doing really, really well. Let's also pray for Miss Marianne Fuller with her cancer, Marta Whitehead with her cancer, Francis Murray also with cancer, and Jennifer Daniels with her cancer and the radiation treatments that she is undergoing. Let's also continue to pray for Barbara Urie, Bethany Walker, Mary Helen Gupton, Meredith Walujo as well, uh, serving in Uganda. We want to lift her and her family up. Let's also pray for Brandon Shiraus. This is Miss Susan's son with just some uh, health and other complications that he's got right now, and also the family of Artis Evans. This is uh, Miss Susan's granddaughter's Boyfriend's grandma, got it, Ooh. she passed away and so uh, after, after a battle with illness, so we want to lift up that family as well. Other prayer needs we want to lift up this morning before we come to the Lord. The Beasley family, his wife, Sandra Beasley, passed away. Pray for the, the family of Sandra Beasley. We also want to pray for, um, uh, for our own Beasley family with your grandmother. We're continuing to pray for her. Any updates on her? It is cancer and it's very aggressive cancer, so um, there is no treatment or cure for it. So she has to decide if she wants to pursue chemo to kind of extend, like, you know, but um, yeah, just pray for her. She's, it's pretty heavy on them, so. All right, well, let's pray for Allie's. Family, as her grandfather, fa grandmother found out she has a very aggressive cancer and has decisions to make. So let's pray for that whole family and pray for you, you guys as well um, during this time. Uh, this Friday and Saturday, I'll be going with Duke Memorial back to West Virginia on the mission trip. And, um, just prayers that safe travels both ways and that we're a blessing to the people there. All right, we'll pray for Gene and the group from Duke Memorial as they do their annual trek up to the mountains of West Virginia for their mission trip. We'll pray for you guys. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, we want to pray for those affected by that tornado in Kentucky, I think mostly. Uh, we want to lift up those families whose lives have been completely upended in a very uh, difficult time of the year for that to happen. I don't think it was mentioned, but I could be wrong. Um, the family of Betty Ray Frazier, she passed away. Uh, she lived in White Level. Um, they had her grave side yesterday. So she was in prayer for the Frazier family. All right, we'll be in prayer for the family of Betty Mae Frazier. I'd like to pray for my niece, Veronica Fuller. She's having a heart ablation this week and just need our prayers. All right, we'll pray for the I pray for Veronica Fuller as she's having a heart abla ablation, and uh, we'll lift her up in prayer. This is, well, this is a prayer place too, but uh, with, I'm going to have a little meeting with the uh, committee, uh, refreshment committee at the church. Okay. All right, five-minute meeting, the refreshment committee. That, that sounds so like, that can mean a lot of things, like the refreshment committee. But I know what you mean. Yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, five-minute meeting for the refreshment committee, uh, so social committee after church. Yeah, but I, like, I think I like, I'm going to make a motion. We change it to the refreshment committee. That sounds good. All right, let's lift these things up in prayer to the Father. Father God, we thank you. Well, we praise you for who you are. You are holy. You are sovereign. You are in control. And God, we thank you that despite all of these things and despite how sinful we are, you love us. God, may we never get over the love of God. 
And God, we thank You for this season in which we remember the way in which You loved us and that You sent the Son to become one of us. To walk through this life. To endure suffering. To die for us on the cross and to rise again. Father, as we reflect upon what Jesus has done for us, fill us with joy. This time of the year and all times of the year. God, we pray for these many needs that we've lifted up. Some have great rejoicings. Others have great, great sorrows. We pray, Father, that you would be at work amongst those in in their sufferings and their trials. Perhaps trials we haven't even mentioned. God, I pray that you would... Uh, Just shower them with your love. And for those who do not know Jesus, we pray that their trials would help them to see their great desperate need for a Savior. And for those who are believers, we pray that these trials and sufferings would help them to lean in to the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that as we worship you today, that you would fill our hearts, fill our minds, fill our souls with the joy and the love of Jesus. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our next present is Angels We Have Heard on High, page 100 in the red note. And we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Please stand.
This is a, this is a Christmas song that Danielle and Kyle and I wrote at the kitchen table one day. Thank you, Gupton Bolton family, and Avery. And Avery. <laughs> Avery was <singing> also. <laughs> hey, man, we're so grateful for you guys and how you're shepherding your gifts for the church, and we're thankful for each and every one of you as well for being here today in worship. If you're wondering. If this is the new sound system, no, it's not. You may be wondering, like, man, we spent all this money on this? No. <laughs> this is the temporary stopgap until we have the big one. I guess the, 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 the freighter is still out there uh, waiting to be unloaded. So uh, this is the temporary stopgap, and they were very kind to, to give us this so the choir could use it for their cantata next week. If you have a Bible this morning, let's see your Bibles. All right. 
Very good. We got pew Bibles there if you don't have one. We're going to be in the book of Philippians, chapter 4. Philippians, chapter 4. You may be wondering, like, is there a rhyme to his reason? Why are we balancing all over? Well, the last two years we've looked at a lot of Old Testament passages that anticipate the coming of Christ. This year we're looking at a handful of New Testament passages that I think reflect and and, and represent kind of what this really means for for all of us. So Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. I'm going to read the verse. It's very simple, very short. And we're going to pray. And we'll, uh, we'll dig into it and see what it has to say to us today. Philippians 4, 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Short and sweet. Let's pray. Father God. Help us to rejoice in the Lord always. Help us to rejoice in the Lord right now. Help us to rejoice in the Lord this Christmas season. Help us to rejoice in the Lord every other time of the year. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Earlier in the service, uh, I specifically requested, and I appreciate Martha making this happen, the choir sang for us, God rest ye merry gentlemen. Uh, y'all, y'all have heard that song before, right? God rest you, merry gentlemen. Have you ever wondered, though, what in the world it's talking about? I mean, if you open your bulletin and look there, we've got, we've got uh, the, the, the name of the song in your bulletin. God rest ye, merry gentlemen. <laughs> you look at it, and you stare at it a little bit, and you think, what in the world does that mean? It sounds like it means God rest... May God help you have a nap, right? Ye merry gentlemen, you happy fellows. That's what it sounds like it's saying. May God help you have a nap, you happy fellows. What does this mean, God rest ye merry gentlemen? Well, I did some research this week. Here's what I found out. The word rest doesn't mean take a snooze. The word rest in this original meaning and and what it, it meant when it was written is more the idea of being rest assured or remain, or stay. And so so it doesn't mean take a nap, it means may God God help you be rest assured, or remain. And and also, if you look at at, at the the song uh, on the bulletin, uh, our English, well, it it would work better if we put a comma after Mary. God rest ye Mary, comma, gentlemen. You say, what? I didn't come here for a grammar lesson today, what are you talking about? In other words, this is what it means. It means, may God keep you merry, comma, you gentlemen. May God help you stay happy and joyful, everybody. And that makes sense in light of the other lyrics. The the rest of the lyrics say, may God rest you merry, gentlemen. Let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us from Satan's power when we were gone astray. O tidings of comfort and joy. The songwriter is saying, he's not saying take a nap. He's saying, let God keep you merry. Don't be dismayed. Have comfort and joy. And the implication of this is that the the songwriter, the author, is writing to people who are not merry. Who are dismayed. Who don't have that comfort and joy. And I wonder this morning if that describes you. If you are among those who have a hard time feeling merry and having the comfort and joy today. And if that is you, I want you to know you're not alone. Not just today, but all parts of the year. I saw a recent poll, a Harris poll that said only 33% of Americans consider themselves happy. Just a third of us think we're happy. And amongst all the countries, America is 17th in the world in happiness. And if you look at the stats, there have been staggering rises in anxiety and depression for both young adults and baby boomers in recent years. 
So the question today is, how can we rest ye merry, gentlemen? How can we have those tidings of comfort and joy? During Christmas, yes, but at all parts of the year. Listen, this is a big, complicated problem. I don't pretend to have all the solutions, particularly in a 25-minute sermon. Some of these things, some of these questions of, of happiness and joy wade into the topics of anxiety and depression, and we don't have time to fully navigate all those today. But the Apostle Paul does address joy in this letter to the Philippian church. And so I want us to reflect on what he says about the topic of joy. Again, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. First observation, we can rejoice in hard times. We can rejoice in hard times. This verse is couched in a broader conversation in Philippians about how we are to think. And in this verse, Paul gives the same command two times. And when he, if he does that in that short, attention, that short of time, then that means we should pay attention. Here's the command. Rejoice, right? Do you know what rejoice means? Rejoice means be glad. Be happy. Have joy. And so Paul was telling his friends at Philippi, rejoice. Be glad. Have those tidings of comfort and joy. This wasn't the only time he call them to do so. Paul uses the word rejoice at least six other times in the book of Philippians. For example, chapter 2, verse 17, he says this, Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. And this theme of joy pervades the letter of Philippians. Clearly, Paul is rejoicing. He wants these people also to rejoice. We wonder why. Why this theme? Well, because times were hard for the Philippian believers. The people he's writing to, these Christians that he is penning this letter to, they were being ostracized for their faith. They had believed in Jesus. They had trusted in Jesus as Savior. And yet for doing so, historians tell us they were kicked out of all the popular circles in their culture. They were kicked out of workers' unions. They were rejected in social life. For them to choose to follow Christ meant they would not be popular amongst their peers. In a lot of ways, the folks in Philippians, the folks in Philippi, were kind of like Hermie in Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. You remember Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer? Yeah. Hermie, yeah, there we go. Yeah, for one of you guys loves Hermie and Rudolph. Hermie is an elf, right? Uh, all his friends, elf friends, what's their job? Guys, what's their job? Toys, they make toys, right? They're toy makers. Hermie, though, does he want to be a toy maker? No. No. What does he want to be? A dentist. <laughs> he wants to be a dentist. And if you remember the movie, all of Hermes' little elf buddies are not impressed with this career decision. If you remember, they're all, you know, whispering to each other, Hermie doesn't like to make toys. Hermie doesn't like to make toys, right? And they keep going around and, and they, they treat him like an outcast because he has spurned everything that they hold dear. That's kind of like what these Christians were experiencing in Philippi. They were like Hermie. God had called them to be a dentist. Not really, but to, to follow him, not follow what everybody else was doing. To, to, to transfer not from toy making to dentistry, but from one set of gods to the one true gods, and their peers were not impressed. It was hard for these Christians in Philippi. But even though they were in a situation in which it would be very easy to mope, Paul says, rejoice. Maybe this is you today. You feel like Hermie. <laughs> you, you, God's called you to do something and everyone else doesn't understand. Maybe you're going through a hard time. Maybe you're suffering. Maybe you're lonely. 
Maybe you feel like there's nobody that cares. You're not happy. You're not joyful. You don't have those tidings of comfort and joy. And if that is you this morning, listen, this word is written for people just like you. God is urging all of us, He's urging you to rejoice, even and especially in hard times. You think, okay, well that's easier said than done. How is it that I can rejoice? Well, Paul explains next. He says we can rejoice because of the Lord. We can rejoice because of the Lord. Again, Philippians 4.4, rejoice in the Lord. Truthfully, Paul didn't have a ton to rejoice about either. When he had been in Philippi, when he had uh, visited this place, the, 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 where the people he's writing to, he had once been there. When he was there with them years prior, he had been charged with false crimes. He had been stripped. He had been beaten. And he had been thrown in jail. And now years later, Paul is writing this letter to the Philippian believers, and his situation had not really improved. How do we know? Because Paul is likely writing this very letter from a prison cell in Rome. (laughs) He has no material comforts. He has no freedom. He has no cozy holiday plans. He can't come to the Christmas party next Sunday. He can't even watch Netflix or scroll Facebook or wear his comfy socks. He's biding time in a jail cell not knowing if he will be executed. This is not a recipe we would cook up for glad tidings of comfort and joy. In fact, I cannot imagine that the next Hallmark Christmas movie will feature this as their plot, right? This is not what we dream of when we think of the Christmas season or joy or anything. It sounds like a situation that would give us immense sorrow and pain, but Paul has joy. He has so much joy that he's inviting other people to come alongside him and rejoice in the Lord. See, I think Paul understands something that a lot of us have a hard time with that that we need to learn from him. Paul understands that our joy doesn't depend on our circumstances. Our joy doesn't depend on our pocketbooks, our wealth. Our joy doesn't depend on the Christmas season or filled stockings or wrapped presents. Our joy is not found in those things. Our joy is found in the Lord. In other words, the depth of our joy depends on the object of our joy. If we try to find joy in our money or our toys or our jobs or the Christmas season or even people, That joy is not going to last very long. Because as good as those things are, a lot of those are great things. They were never intended to carry the weight of our needs and our expectations. The depth of our joy depends on the object of our joy. Let me give you an example. Back during vacation Bible school, um, uh, we just had the Gupton Bolton crew up here singing songs. Well, the Gupton Bolton crew had come, decorated this whole area for, for Vacation Bible School. And I don't know if you guys remember, but there were, a, you had a couple of boxes to represent the different, you know, first place, second place, third place in the Olympic Games. All right, so it, looked, it was really, really great. I, you guys always go all out in decorating. Well, there was a child, I don't remember who the child was, but thought that those boxes were sturdy enough to stand on. <laughs> And so the child ran up and was hopping on a box and it started, you know, bending a little bit and we're like, get off the box, get off the box, right? Why? Because the object was not sturdy enough to hold their weight, right? The same kind of is true with our joy. A lot of times we want to place our joy in cardboard boxes and it's not sturdy enough to hold the weight of our joy. If the object of our joy is something weak, it will be fleeting because we will be crumbling and falling and hitting the floor, right? But if the object of our joy is in someone strong, then our joy will be everlasting. And there is no stronger object, no stronger source of joy than the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know, 
I know this sounds like a cheap Sunday school answer. I know it sounds very trite. I'm the preacher up here telling you, be happy because of Jesus, right? It sounds so trite. But for Paul, this was absolutely the case. He explains why back in Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. He said this. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 and 8. But whatever gain I had, I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. See, in a prior life, Paul had it all. He was successful. He was respected. He was brilliant. He had it all, but he didn't have Jesus. And when Jesus appeared to him on that road to Damascus, he realized how precious Jesus was, and he gave all of that up so he could follow Jesus. Paul recognized he was not the saint he imagined he was. He realized he was a sinner. He realized he was bound for God's holy wrath and judgment. But in that moment when Jesus appeared to him, God God extended grace to him. He trusted that Jesus had died for him, offered him forgiveness, and this sinner gained salvation. This hopeless basket case gained hope and joy. And I think we can see from his life that true joy comes not from getting what we want, but from not getting what we do deserve. Let me say that again. True joy comes not from getting what we want, but from not... Wait. True... Let me say it again. I confused myself. True joy comes not from getting what we desire, but from not getting what we do deserve. All right, I should just work on that in the preparation. I should have fixed that sentence. That was, that was a little bit cumbersome. <laughs> Going back to the box analogy. True joy comes when we stand on something sturdy, right? We can rejoice in the Lord because of that cradle of Christ. Jesus' humble birth teaches us that Jesus entered into our muck and mess and pain. We rejoice because the cradle shows that He understands our pain. We can also rejoice in the Lord because of the cross of Christ where He bore our sin and our iniquity and He solved our greatest problem. We can also rejoice because of the coming of Christ. Because we know at the end of the story, Jesus is coming back and all the problems that still plague us, He's going to fix them. When we rejoice, we can rejoice in the Lord because He gets it. He understands our pain. We rejoice in the Lord because He solved our greatest problem. We rejoice in the Lord because one day He's going to come back and fix it all. He is the source of joy for today, for tomorrow, for all eternity. All right, let's go from theory land. Let's go and apply this to our lives. Where are you finding your joy? Where are you finding and and, and, and what, what boxes are you standing on? What is trying to hold the weight of your joy? Or what are you looking for to give you? the greatest happiness and fulfillment? Is it a relationship or a significant other? Is it your kids? Is it the Christmas season with all the feels and the holly and the music? Is it an addiction? Or do you just bounce around from distraction to distraction so quickly that you don't even know what makes you happy? You're just trying to stay busy every moment to the next. Listen, Some of those things are bad. Some of those things are good. But if you pursue those good things for ultimate joy, you're going to be let down. But if you pursue Jesus, stand firm in the joy that He offers, then all those other joys will come as a byproduct. And if you've never had a point in your life where you've turned from your sins and placed your faith in Jesus, you've changed allegiances, maybe maybe that's what you need to do today. Place your faith in Jesus. So we can rejoice in the Lord. He is the source of our joy. Finally, third, we can rejoice in the Lord at all times. Paul says rejoice in the Lord sometimes. Is that what he says? Rejoice in the Lord always. Yeah. 
For a lot of us, our joy is like a, like a pendulum. We swing back and forth between happy and sad, or excited or dejected, or joyful and despondent. And a lot of times when we find our joy in these situational things, that's what's going to happen. But Paul's saying that the, the joy we find in the Lord is different. We rejoice in the Lord always. Let's play a little game to see if we understand what this means. Kids, I'm going to need your help, okay? By the way, I taught the older kids Sunday school class today, and they were a delight. So thank you guys for letting me, letting me teach you guys. It was really fun. All right, kids and everybody, help me out. I'm going to say a situation, and you say rejoice in the Lord always, okay? Let's try it out. What about on Sundays? You got it. You got it. Okay, rejoice in the Lord always, okay? What about on Mondays? Okay. Now, what about on December 25th, Christmas Day? What about on December 26th, the day after Christmas? Okay, all right. Now, this is more for the parents. Parents, what about when your kids are behaved and acting like little angels? What about when they're acting like tyrants? <laughs> kids, what about when your parents are super happy and, and just want to do all the fun things with you? What about when your parents are grouchy? Yeah, that, sometimes that happens, doesn't it? We, we know, we understand. What about when we feel like our life is perfect? What about when our life is crumbling to pieces? This is a little game we were playing, but I think what I want us to see that in all times, in all situations, on the December 25th and the December 26th, 26th we rejoice in the Lord always. Now, this doesn't mean that every day is going to be easy. It's not. It doesn't mean that you won't have worries or fears, because you will. It doesn't mean that you're not allowed to have bad days, because newsflash, they're coming. <laughs> you don't always have to have a smile on your face. You don't always have to pretend that everything's okay when it's not. That's not what I'm talking about. Here's what this means. No matter what comes our way, no matter the valleys that we descend into, our ultimate joy comes from the Lord. Our ultimate joy doesn't depend on our circumstances. And so we don't have to be that pendulum that swings back and forth like a grandfather clock. God sustains us in the good days. And He also sustains us in the bad days. And because of this, we can have this even-handed, steady, consistent Baseline joy that comes not from anything in our world, but from trusting in the One who has saved us and redeemed us and at Christmas, we remember, came down to be one of us. This Christmas, if you're struggling with a lack of joy, I understand this is a big and complex problem. It may be that you are wrestling with some sort of depression or anxiety. It may be that you're going through a season of great loss and suffering. It may be that there are real problems and I do not want to try to offer glib solutions. In fact, many of the heroes of our faith battled seasons of depression and fear. How many of y'all have ever heard of Charles Spurgeon? Prince of Preachers. He battled depression his entire life. Or How many of you have ever heard of the great missionary Adoniram Judson? Adoniram Judson once was so grieved and depressed he dug a grave and sat beside it for days staring at it. It's okay to go through sorrows. It's okay to be sad. But no matter where we're coming from, no matter what the situation is you're navigating, the solution starts right here. We can find joy even in the pain, even in the suffering, even in depression, when we look to the Lord. He is big. He is strong. He is great. He is wonderful. And we, when we understand the beauty of the Gospel, that you and I deserve judgment and wrath, but Jesus offers us grace and forgiveness, we have a joy that will last. And we can rejoice in the Lord always. That's how we can sing, God rest ye merry, gentlemen. 
And that's how we can have those tidings of comfort and joy. Let's pray. Father God, as we reflect upon the joy that comes from knowing Jesus, I pray especially for those in the room who for this today or this season, joy is not coming very easy for them. I pray that you would give them the wisdom and discernment to see if perhaps the cause of their lack of joy is because they've been placing their, their faith and their trust in something that can't satisfy. And if that's them this morning, I pray that right now they say, Lord, I realize that you are the ultimate source of joy and I want to trust and place my faith in you. And for others who, who are believers in Jesus and they're just navigating those valleys of life, they're navigating hardships, sorrows, grief, pain. Help them to feel and realize that you are with them there in that grief. You are there with them in the pain and they can rejoice in the Lord always. And especially right now. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we conclude, we're going to sing hymn of invitation 95, Go Tell It on the Mountain. Uh, and we picked this song because it is overflowing with joy. Uh, it is overflowing with happiness. And so as we sing this song, reflect on the source of that joy, Jesus Christ. Psalm, uh, hymn 95, let's stand and sing it together. Thank you all for being here today. Let's conclude with Romans 15, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go with God this week.